So in this podcast for the Light Review, we are joined by Axel Schmidt, part of the world famous Ingo Maurer design team. Hello. How are you? Hello, nice to see you. Nice to speak to you too. Um, now, I think if my memory serves me correctly, I first came across Ingo at the Saloni del Mobile in, in Zero One, where he was displaying the first lead table lamp I'd ever seen, which struck me, apart from striking me as being really cool, it just struck me as also being the most un-German thing I'd seen from Ingo Maurer. Um, did this product did this product ever make it to production out of interest? I think it was called the E LED E E. It's probably before your time, but it was quite cool. It's just a circuit well, board. It's a circuit board, yes. LED. I remember I, when we were thinking about that name, what we can call it. <laughs> and um, it was a circuit board, and it was like just um very how can I explain it we tried to be very honest in that so we took the circuit board we just showed it not only from the nice side but also from the normally hidden side and uh, uh, Ingo always had a, a fable we say for for circuit boards he, he really liked that green color he liked all that um, soldering on the back and all the little wires and um to make it even more um, strong in that appearance, we added that um, that vice grip at the end. I, yeah. I don't know if you. No, I remember that it was cool. I remember, I remember seeing it. I didn't know if it was just like a. Obviously, it was a prototype at, at the Saloni, but I, I couldn't work out if it was just for fun. I because it looked so raw, didn't it? And I, I know Inga Maurer was famous for his products being a little bit shall we say, off the wall. But this just looked like someone had, I don't know, clipped it on that morning. <laughs> it was quite funny. It was quite yeah, nice. It, it, was, it, it was not clipped on that morning, but it was clipped on at some point, at some morning. <laughs> and so we, we left it. And, and that's, and that's I, I would say, the uh, that was that, way of approach we have we had and still have and and um it's tinkering around it's it's like in a laboratory we try out uh, and this is important when you work with light you cannot only have it in a concept stage or on a drawing or a computer stage you have to you have to fumble around with the light itself and and that was not only the light effect we were working on, but also the the, the shape of the lamp. And and when that vice grip showed up, and we thought it fits, then we just left. <laughs> no, it's very, but the, I think the thing that struck me is how un-Germanic it was. But I, obviously, I'm British, so I'm, I couldn't say whether that's true or not. But I'd say that when you think of German design being functionalist, that probably takes it too far, doesn't it? I mean. It's more, right. more refined, perhaps, normally than, than just a circuit board. But that's why I really liked it. It was really, was he there? I must admit, I always tell the story that I met him, but maybe I, that's in my imagination. Was he there in 2001? Would he have been at the stand, do you think? Probably not. He, he was there, yes. Was, was it at the Euro Luce or was yes. it in the, um, at Crizia in the city? I think it was a satellite show. Yeah, we had, at that time, we had uh, always... Um, made uh, we always made an exhibition in town in in the backyard of Spazio Crizia and and that was that was a very nice opportunity because Signora Mandelli the, the owner of Crizia uh, who who uh, made it possible that we could um, exhibit there she said she she don't want to see um like serial products she mm. was more interested in the what Ingo called the bella figura he, he always wanted <laughs> the bella figura so uh, that was a space dedicated to this show what could be possible what we love to work on and and that's how it turned out and um since since we all 
uh, we're very involved. As you can imagine, the, the salon it comes closer and closer, and you work on these last minute ideas, and it, and then you 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 fill the truck, you you load the truck with all the crates, and and you go <laughs> to to Milano, and then you unpack everything, and day Close and night. Fingers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, since that is also the, that. The, uh, the kind we approached to exhibit and how we approach because you can see comparisons to the way we work. We have our own production. We have, we are not only a design studio. We have a, a production line. We have workshops. We have all the parts that you need for selling and, and distribution. And um, so it's all small scale because there are like 50 people in the company, but since it's all there, we are all involved in all these stages. And, and that shows, I guess, in the exhibitions. I think certainly that's true, that what you show in the exhibition is like raw mower, isn't it? But I know, having studied product design myself, that obviously Bauhaus is monumental in terms of how German design is viewed across the world. But I would have said, is it true to say that Ingo doesn't really fit into that conventional Germanic style? It, it could almost be closer to the German poster culture. You know, it's more playful, more experimental and bold. Is it where do you get your influences from for your products? Well, you are right. The, the German approach is is often put in relation to the Bauhaus and and um, and even earlier the Werkbund started and then from Bauhaus it, it went to the school in Ulm. I don't know if you heard about that school in Ulm. And, and the beginnings, they were not as strict. Many people think, okay, Bauhaus was rectangular houses and white surfaces uh, and super clean. But it started from, from I think, uh, uh, kind of, they were hoping to get the art and the craft yeah. together. It was theatrical, wasn't it? Because, I mean, even Kodinsky, I think, was at the Bauhaus, wasn't he? And yes. I remember the first stage of Bauhaus, and this might be wrong, but it was more, it was more, um, I suppose you could call it blue, blue sky theatrical, and then it started to become more functional after the second stage. But that's what is more thought of, isn't it? But like Inga Maurer products, I guess they would be more associated with the first stage of Bauhaus, the more flamboyant, exuberant uh, expression of design, I suppose, which is great. I mean, it's brilliant. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because even some some people thought Ingo Maurer is an Italian company. I, I don't know I'm why. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, a few occasions I've been talking about Ingo Maurer and it, I'm not going to say it's Italians, but sometimes when I do speak to Italians, they're like, oh, Ingo Maurer, he's great Italian designer. I'm like, no, he's German. <laughs> and then they're like, no, no, he's definitely Italian. Just look at his stuff, because you look at his stuff and you're like, nah, that can't come from Germany. That's not German, that's Italian. <laughs> so it's funny, I've heard that a lot as well. It's funny. Yeah, maybe I think one of, of that that details that that for some people are difficult to, to combine in the head is that it, at Ingo Maura products, there's a lot of humor involved. And, and I think that is a difficult part for Germans. There, there is, it's very difficult to be <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> Germany. So, I don't like to stereotype, but Germans humor, German and humor, that's sort of two different worlds for me. <laughs> so that, that might be the thing why Ingo Maura Germans looked at the company not so, they were like, what is, what kind of company is that? And I think he felt, uh, as we say, as a black sheep, he felt quite nice in that role. He, he liked yeah. to be a different kind of, of, of company, a different kind of German. And, and I remember or talking to him about design, he always was afraid of German attributes. So when there was something very heavy, he related to it as a German panzer. That is <laughs> German. 
it's or in colors he said ah that is the german gray so <laughs> for him he somehow tried to avoid that maybe mm, if it was by coincidence or not that i cannot say but um he was aware that uh, um german always was a german kind was kind of heavy so he never related to the Bauhaus or, or even to the, the, what I said, the, the school in Ulm that then maybe to came to the brown design in Dieter Rams and all this like very balanced and, and a quiet design. For him, it was somehow the Ingo Maurer was founded in that because it was a company of the 60s. Um, but he more and, and more to Italy, I would say he had a relation to the United States. So actually, before he started the company in Munich, he started um, in, in California and he, he wanted to be more on the graphic design side. So yeah, you can see that. At that time, in the beginning of the 60s, the, the USA and especially California was like very far and very open. And, and that's what he was looking for, these openness, this, these chances that were there all the time. And then he came back, actually was planning to go to London, but then started the company in Munich because his wife was from Munich, I guess. And there, it helped us to it helps us to have that company there because in munich where it is now humor wise even colder than in the rest of germany <laughs> so quite no, it's heavy not possible, and, it's not it, possible to can, be colder <laughs> you can focus on what you work but on the other side munich and the little towns around munich have a lot of arts and crafts and, and workshops. You have woodworking, you have um, goldsmith, you have glass, you have people working with glass. And this helped us a lot because Ingo Maurer is based on manufacturing and based on materials and based on um, technology, technological mm, mm, thinking. So in that frame of Munich and Germany, uh, we could combine these, these seriousness with a little bit experiment and humor. That's really interesting because obviously your comment about humor, because the thought that, that your products stood out like a sore thumb, that English expression in Munich, because they are so... You said that you use the latest technology and you're, you benefit from being in that area, but you also your products are almost the opposite. And I, and I can think why people might think you're Italian because I just thought of Lucciolino, which is obviously um, an Italian um, word. And I, I can imagine that's why they think that, but I mean, it is. it must be true that your products in that area, when they first started out, were so radical that you had to wonder who was going to buy them. I mean, it's, it's quite far out to buy an Ingo Maurer product, isn't it? Apart from the fact they're expensive. You have to, it's almost a, a little bit of a design risk by specifying it or using it in your house. That's, that's true. That's indeed true. The, the risk is something that um, is important in what we, we brought to the market. Um, a risk in two in two levels. The one, one of these risks is that um, there was not much marketing done before. It was not that we were sitting together and, and thinking, okay, what would people buy next year? And with what product we could mostly benefit of this clients or, or trends. That was something that Ingo didn't want to think about. So when he saw material, when he saw a, a shape, when he's when we were thinking about 
some kind of lamps. He, he always focused on the lamp itself and, and wanted to see, do we get to somewhere when we work on it? So that was the first risk because we didn't think of <laughs> later who will buy it. And the that's second not, risk, that's not the German, second sorry. risk is that um, maybe that was in his uh, um, in his personality that he tried to um, get across borders. That was his risk. Like we try it, we go that way, even though we don't know where we get out and and how complicated it will be. And and sometimes <laughs> we started to work on things that turned out to be very complicated. And um, and there you you have to take a risk to continue and say I think we will get somewhere. Is there a part of your product that does reflect German culture? Because I, for me, it sounds like you're more Mediterranean than, than Germ Germanic. But is there a part but, of Germany that does actually reflect Inga Maurer? Yeah, there are quite a number of projects because Germany is not so in design wise, you cannot put Germany in, in what is the vision of Germany as a culture or as a German, as a person. So design-wise, it is in a different um, tone. And um, there are a lot of German products, I would say, uh, especially the ones that, um, that, um, think about a neutral space um, to blend in. This, is, this might also be a Scandinavian approach that you blend in to that space where you are. Erko. But, I think um, of, uh, when I think of German lighting products, I think of Erko and Inga Maurer, but mainly Erko, you know Erko? Do you know Erko? Uh, yeah, 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 Erko. Mm -hmm. That, yes, sorry, Erko. Then that's what I would consider the archetypical Italian, uh, sorry, German lighting company, you know, exactly as you describe it, blending into the architecture, good, well, well made products, quality brands, you know, the Brauns of this world, the Richard Sappers of this world would probably um, spring to mind. Uh, but yeah, the, the Richard Sapper is a very, a good person that you brought up because, uh, Actually, I was studying at his in his class. I did my diploma in he, he took my diploma. And um, when he took a sabbatical where he was teaching in Stuttgart, Richard Zapper, he invited Ingo to come because they knew each other quite well. They are both uh, were born in the same year, 1932. And he, for many people, these are two opposite figures. Yes. Ingo Mar Star-wise, definitely. And, um, but in the end, Richard Sapper was working in Italy. He, he had his office there. And, um, but um, it was what both, and that is a generation, what both, I guess, had in common was this um, concentration on details in a project, in a product. So uh, think about our um, the Ingo Maurer Yaya Ho system. These two wires that are in a space, yes. low voltage, and you hang different things. It's a modular system, and and the designers thought of everything of, of the material of the strings, of the the sockets, of the the materials of the the shades, and and this was very. Uh, focused on, mm, on all the details. So in a way, I guess what you're saying is it's, um, you haven't sacrificed the functionalism through the aesthetic. You basically blended the two together. So um, maybe to surmise Inga Maurer's work, you would say it's a perfect blend of functionalism and aesthetic. Even if the aesthetic is the thing that you first catches your eye and draws you in, it's made in such a way which you know it's not going to 
blow up, probably is the wrong word, uh, fail or, yeah, or makes the best use of the current technology, maybe. In fact, to, actually, to finish off, I, where are you guys going in the future? What's, what's the future for Inga Maurer in terms of products and in this world where we're trying to reuse and we're becoming ever more aware of the environmental impacts of, of products and things? How, how, do you, how do you blend that into your design? Well, the reusage and the sustainability is a very good, um, how would I call it? That's a good situation for us because um, since we are producing ourselves and, and we have that, that biotope of company in, in the midst of many uh, workshops and suppliers around Munich, this helps us to be straightforward in that thinking. And I guess we have to make this part of the company much more aware for the people. For us, it always seemed normal to, to build the things ourselves and to have things that we reuse or to have things that we can repair because we are a company from the 60s. That's the way how people built products then and and that's the the what you the client expected at that time if he buys something he wants to come back to that desk with that if it's broken and ask for a repair so i guess we have to see what these as this sustainability comes from a thinking of the 60s what else can we bring in the future from these things on the other side, what have we, do we have to change? Because it was not everything better at that time. There were many things very bad at that time. So what can we throw overboard and how can we change that um, way of working without change the soul of the company? That's an excellent answer. I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh... Thanks very much for your time. Great to hear from someone who worked with one of my design heroes, Ingo Maurer. So if you liked what you saw, please hit the like and share button. And thanks very much for tuning in. Hope to see you next time. Bye.